Yeah. So my other announcement is that we are doing our War of the Ghosts assignment today. So closer to the end of class, I will be telling you a spooky story of the War of the Ghosts. And remember, you are you uh, only need to recall the information. You only need to recall the information. You have to make sure that at least 12 hours have elapsed before you try to remember it. We will start talking about everyday memory. If we don't start it today, we will start it on Monday. And as a result, I want to go through your stories. I am going to share some stories, but I will not be naming names. Because sometimes you get some really funny memories of this weird, very chaotic story. All right, so one other announcement. As you can see, we have a prospective student visiting today. Say hi to Charlotte. Um, sorry, I hope you don't mind I'm drawing attention to you, but um, welcome. If you or your mom have any questions about anything in this class, feel free to treat this like you're an actual student in my class. Ask me any questions that you want. I will be happy to help you out. Sound pretty good? Okay, you don't have a quiz this weekend. You, you just have to remember the war of the ghosts. So please do that. I will have tests for you on Monday. That's a promise. I always get them back to you within a week. All right, any other questions before we begin? I just had a slice of pumpkin pie at the board of trustees meeting, so I'm full of sugar. They go all out for them. It, it is kind of nice. They had spaghetti squash. I was very happy about that. <laughs> All right, let me go ahead and get our notes open. So the last time that we were here, we were talking about concepts and knowledge. I'm going to go ahead and turn off that speaker because I can hear the white noise. There, now everybody is a little bit happier. So the last time we were here, we were talking about different types of concepts and knowledge in semantic memory. And we finished up by talking, so we talked about a few different ways of thinking about concepts and knowledge. So we started by talking about Collins and Quillian's hierarchical model. Um, and one of the major problems that it has is that it does not account for typicality effects. So according to the hierarchical model, it should take you the same amount of time to verify the sentence, a tomato is a fruit, as it would an apple is a fruit. And you and I both know that is not the case. Most people only know that a tomato is a fruit because there is somebody in your life who will go, actually, a tomato is a fruit. And that's the only reason you know that, unless you've taken botany with Dr. Cohn. And I have a feeling she does a good job of explaining why fruits are fruits. So we know that the hierarchical model is not correct. It does not account for the fact that more typical members of a class are easier to judge as being members of that class than atypical members. So comparing, for example, canaries and robins, very typical birds, to chickens and penguins, very atypical birds. We then moved on to talking about Collins and Loftus's spreading activation model, where items that are more closely related receive more activation when we think about a particular concept. And then we finished up by talking about the perceptual functional theory, that we basically, for living things, focus on what an object looks like or its perceptual features, and then for non-living things, we focus on their usage, their functional properties. And we finished up by talking about some brain regions that tend to code for these different types of properties because we do find that when certain parts of the brain are damaged, certain types of deficits occur. So now we're going to talk about prototypes and exemplars. So I want to go back to the beginning of class on Wednesday when we all drew dogs on the board or we drew pictures of dogs in our notes. Now, for those of you that looked at some of the different dogs that were drawn on the chalkboard, what sort of things did you notice that all of those dogs had in common? Huh? They have snouts. Okay. They have eyes. They all had floppy ears. Did you notice anything else? They all kind of looked a little houndish. Not all of them. There were a couple that looked like pit bulls, and I drew my dog, who is most definitely not a hound. But they all tended to have a pretty similar sort of look to them, didn't they? And that's not necessarily a problem 
But it does seem to speak to this idea that when we think of what a dog is, we have a certain idea in our mind of what a dog looks like. And as we're going to discover, a lot of what we consider to be dogs is very largely based on our experiences with them. So for those of you that drew dogs with long ears, can I ask if any of you have dogs with long ears? You drew a dog with long ears and it didn't have it, Ashton? My dog didn't have long ears. Okay, those of you that had a dog with long ears, how many of you have a dog with long ears or had a dog with long ears? Okay. Sarah, yours had long ears, but you didn't draw, or you drew one with long ears, but you've never had one? Yeah, I've always had dogs with short, pointy ears. So why'd you draw one with long ears? Is that what you just think of when you think of a dog? I feel like one of the persons that I, I was like, taught. Okay. I just really struggled to like come up with pictures. So like, I know my dog, I can describe it to you, but coming up with like an image and uh -huh. just drawing them is quite hard for me. So it seems like maybe, if you don't mind me reading too much into your statement, it seems to me that you were drawing what you think of as an average dog rather than any one particular dog. May I suggest that you were potentially thinking of what we call a prototype? We're going to look at a lot of pictures of dogs today. I know. And for those of you who like cats, I will change these notes in the future and I will make sure there are cats. Or, well, at some point somebody's gonna be like, but I like lizards and I'm not gonna know what to do with that. <laughs> like, but I, so there's a guy that I play trivia with on my quiz bowl team who lives down in South Florida and he gets these big giant like iguanas and lizards in his yard and he always takes pictures with them. Like he likes lizards. Thankfully, he's not in this class. <laughs> okay, so when we think about a prototypical dog, we a prototype is basically a central description or a conceptual core that includes major features of a category. So dogs have ears, they have snouts, they have a nose, they have a tail. We get all of that. But there are a lot of other animals that are not dogs that have those exact same features. So when we think of a dog, we're usually thinking about ears of a certain length, we're thinking of a snout of a certain length, a body shape of a certain kind, a certain height, a certain tail length. And what's interesting about a prototype, because it is a central description or a conceptual core, no dog that you encounter in everyday life actually looks like a prototype. Because a prototype is basically, if you took the average of all dogs in the world and took that average, you get a prototype. But a prototype doesn't actually resemble any particular dog. So a prototype is often going to look like a list of features or of attributes. So can anybody give me some typical attributes of a dog? And I want you to be really specific. All animals have ears, like all mammals have ears and legs and a snout. So see if you can try to give me some attributes, but be really specific on them. A dark, wet, flat nose that has like weird bumps on it. Okay, okay, so it's like their fingerprint, interestingly enough. Okay, a dark, wet nose that has bumps on it. Okay, Sarah. A pink tongue that hurts so that they can drink water easily and it helps them smell. Yeah, and it doesn't work the way you think it does. You think it's going like this. It's actually going, yeah, it's curving under. It's weird. And then Allie, did you have one? Okay, they bark, okay? Yes, yes, they do. <laughs> okay, but here's what's really important when we're talking about this list of features or attributes. It's almost like you're taking the average of all possible dogs. So we're gonna have a snout of an average length, a coat, of an average color, ears of a, an average length. It's not going to look like any particular dog. Now, are there some dog breeds that tend to fit the prototype more than others? Yes. Can you think of a dog that actually might fit the prototype of a dog really well? Lab 
lab? Yes, probably a lab, maybe a golden retriever. Like Labradors are some, are probably closest to that prototype. They're big, but they're pretty average when it comes down to it. Their legs aren't too long or too short. Their body's not too big or too small. Their ears aren't too long or too short. They don't have any sort of extreme values in something. So they don't look like my dog who is basically all muscle and just thin. So it's not going to match any particular dog, but more typical members are gonna be closer to that prototype than atypical members. So for example, a Chihuahua. A Chihuahua is definitely not the prototype. Likewise, a Great Dane or a Great Pyrenees, big giant horse-sized dogs, not gonna fit the prototype. A Basset Hound, definitely not gonna fit the prototype. It's got tiny little legs and long, long ears or a dachshund for that matter. Okay, so when we are determining whether or not something is a member of a category based on a prototype approach, if we want to ask ourselves, is a chihuahua a dog? Is a Weimaraner a dog? Is um, a pit bull a dog? We're going to check the attributes of the concept and the category prototype. So we're going to compare the features of a certain dog and compare them to the prototype. So what we are looking for, we're trying to look for that match between the prototype and the actual dog. And when we do that, we are looking for what are called family resemblances. So here's a lab. You're so cute. I like silver ones myself, but that lab is very cute. Looks like an average dog, ears of an average length, nose of an average length, not too big, not too small, has a lot of family resemblances to the prototype. So it's going to be judged as being a more typical dog. On the other hand, here's a cute little chihuahua. This one's actually really cute. I like them when they're fluffy. Um, this one is really small, very tiny, pointy ears, short little legs, tiny little body, less of a bark and more of a yip or a yap. Um, fewer family resemblances. So while a chihuahua is a dog, it's not going to be judged to be a typical dog. And it's gonna take us a little more time to think about if a chihuahua is a dog or not. So category members that have higher family resemblances are closer to representing the prototype. So when you said a lab is probably closest to the prototype, that is absolutely true. Typical members are generally going to be higher than atypical members. And yet, folks, I say all of this, and do you know what one of the number one dogs that people love in this country is? A pug. <laughs> I'm going to say a thing, and my sister's going to come all the way to California and beat me up. <laughs> I don't get pugs. <laughs> my sister's pug is very cute and very athletic looking. But that is not true for some pugs that I have seen. <laughs> Having said that, though, I have a Vigla, and my dog is weird. <laughs> if you do not know what a Vigla looks like, you are welcome to look at pictures of my dog after class. He is the closest thing I have to a child. <laughs> he certainly acts like one. <laughs> and I know that many of you on campus have seen Smedley. By the way, somebody was told to tell Dr. G that you pet my dog. It must have been somebody in general psychology then. Because I heard from a bird, a little bird that just happens to be my partner, that a student pet got to pet Smedley, and Smedley was very well behaved. Okay, I'm talking like maybe over the past couple of weeks. So probably a gen psych student. I live very close to campus. My dog gets walked four times a day. They know Smedley. <laughs> Sometimes he's a pain in the butt. <laughs> he's a dog. Okay. Everybody good here? Okay. So one of the major complications of prototypes is that family resemblances don't really work for categories that are based on goal-directed behaviors. So 
birthday presents. We kind of talked about this last time. What may be a good birthday present for you might be a terrible birthday present for somebody else. Also, what is a typical birthday present? I think the closest we can think of is maybe cake. Maybe cake. But I have received candles as birthday gifts. I have received socks as birthday gifts. I have received a gift card as a birthday gift or a treadmill as a birthday gift or a cast iron skillet as a birthday gift. Air fryer was the best one. Um, but all of those are very different examples of birthday gifts and they don't look like they have any sort of family resemblance. And I think if you were hard pressed to find a prototypical birthday gift, I think it would be very hard to do so because everybody's different. Some people like useful gifts. Some people like sentimental, emotional gifts. Some people just want you to buy them another pair of running shoes. That person is me. <laughs> uh, additionally, if we're talking about an area of expertise, expertise experts do not use typicality to judge category membership. If you are working at the dog kennel, or if you are working for a dog show like the Westminster Dog Show or the AKC or something like that, you know a variety of different dogs that are certainly not typical dogs. Um, so experts don't use typicality. They use the extra knowledge that they have. They know that atypical members are still members. On the other hand, novices when they're trying to judge category membership, they don't focus on typicality, they focus on whether or not something is familiar to them. So most of the time, we don't actually do these family resemblances. The truth of the matter is, is that when you're judging category membership for dogs, it's going to be your experience that judges whether or not you think something is a dog. If you grew up with domesticated foxes, I know, technically a separate species, but you might think of them as a dog, not because they actually are, but because they feel familiar to you. So this is where we get into the exemplar approach. And the exemplar approach works better. It basically says that your life experiences judge what you consider to be a member of that class or not. So you and I all store large numbers of examples of different category members that we've encountered. And that's helpful because when we're talking about a prototype, we're talking about a really long list of attributes. I don't know about you, but when I'm trying to judge if something is a dog or not, or if something is a fruit or not, I don't look through a long list. I look at what it looks like and I compare it to other experiences that I've had. That's gonna be a lot less abstract than a common list of attributes. And some of the evidence that we have for this comes from typicality effects. Guess what? More typical members of a class are typically going to be, or going to have more stored instances of those. Labradors are very typical dogs. And guess what? They're very popular dogs to own. And because of that, you're probably going to see a lot more people with Labradors than you will people that have Weimaraners or Great Danes or Chihuahuas. So you are going to judge a lab as being a more typical dog, not because of family resemblances, but you have more stored instances of those dogs in your mind. And you're going to judge those as being more common. However, what I will say that's really nice about the exemplar approach is that dogs are really different from each other. Have y'all seen a Sholo? You need to see it. We almost thought about getting one. They are, sometimes they're called a Mexican hairless dog. They're really cute. But I wanted to show you one because if you looked at it and I hadn't just told you that it was a dog, you may not necessarily think it was. You may have seen it in Coco. They're very cute. You have to take really good care of their skin though, because they have no hair to protect them. Um, but yeah, 
Yeah, it's uh, the Sholo it's Quintly or Le, Quintly. Um, we almost thought about getting but one, but one of the things that's kind of nice about it is that when you're focusing on stored examples that you've seen with a prototype, one of the big problems with the prototype is we're basically taking all of that variability that we see and we're creating an average. And the thing about an average is, is that it's not going to show how variable those different category members can be. When you talk about exemplars, you can preserve that variability. There are many different types of dogs and odds are pretty good. You have examples of many of them. For example, I grew up with two Basset hounds at any given point, a Pekingese, a Golden Retriever, and a Vigla. Those are the dogs I've had. My friends and family have had Shih Tzus and have had Pugs. Cooper's okay. He's just not housebroken. <laughs> that's a problem. Um, but that allows you to have variability rather than lumping them all together into some amorphous typical dog that does not exist. So the exemplar approach actually tends to work a little bit better. Does anybody have any questions on the difference between prototype and exemplar approach? This might come up on your next test, and I know you're not thinking of the next test yet, but it's common. It will happen someday. <laughs> not soon. Someday. <laughs> Any questions? Lauren, do you need a little more time? Mm -hmm. It's cool. I can probably stand to have some more water. Now I'm going to take this Avion bottle and fill it with tap water. <laughs> okay. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the issues with the exemplar approach. So this works well for complex concepts like dog, fruit, birthday presents, et cetera. But it's not really going to work well with simple concept, circle. <laughs> a circle is a very simple concept. Um, a rectangle is a very simple concept. And because of that, we're not necessarily going to need to have all stored instances of circles. Y'all, you know it when you see it. Um, so oftentimes, it, we're going to look for commonalities with these concepts. So it's going to basically revert back to prototype theory. For, com for complex concepts, we're going to rely on the exemplar approach. Now, I would say that more complex concepts do actually require examples. Oops, sorry, I, I got too excited. I got too excited. Yeah. So would the exemplar approach be able to be used with like circle if you were a child just going to high school? Probably. Because, yeah, I would think actually that makes a lot of sense. What I might do is I might go look for any papers that have looked in that shift from prototypes to exemplars and child development. That would be really cool. But that's a really good question. I think that's probably what happens, but I want to look at it, see if there are any papers on that just to be sure. That if you talk to Dr. Keats about it, she'd be able to steer you in the right direction. She teaches the pet child and adolescent development class. I've been here for 10 years. I know that. <laughs> oh, no, don't be sorry. I appreciate your assistance. You know that. I do. I really do, Ashton. And I'm looking forward to reading the notes you wrote on, my, on your test. <laughs> okay. Okay. I appreciate, I will tell you, I don't give extra credit, but if you draw little pictures and make little notes or little jokes in my exams, it makes me smile. Grading's not always my favorite thing, so having little notes of encouragement or silly jokes makes me laugh. One of my gen psych students calls me Dr. Professor Gilchrist just because I caught her on it the first time and now she's just doing it as an inside joke. <laughs> okay, so I want to talk a little bit about schemas and scripts, but I promised you a scary story. And this is the story that you're gonna need to remember for Monday. And yes, I am gonna turn out the lights for this and I'm gonna turn on my ring light so it can be really spooky. I'm guessing they're all taking notes. This is a memory study, not a listening study. <laughs> you're not allowed to remember it for the next 12 hours. That, you're gonna miss the point of the exercise if you try to remember it right now. The point is to remember it later. 
I know. I know it's hard. I know it's hard because every other time I've given you something to remember, you're like, got to write it down now. I know. This time you need at least a 12 hour waiting period. You can do it. Okay. So let me go ahead and look this up. We are, I am going to tell you a story. Ha ha ha. It's not actually that spooky, but it is called The War of the Ghosts. This was originally a study done by Frederick Bartlett, partially looking at schemas and scripts and the way that our cultural biases change what we remember in stories. So you can write that part down, but that's all. Now, don't write down the rest of this. Let me tell you the story. Okay, let me turn on my light. Oh, ooh. It's like we're at a campfire. Okay. <laughs> One night, two young men from Egulac went down to the river to hunt seals. And while they were there, it became foggy and calm. Then they heard war cries and they thought, maybe this is a war party. They escaped to shore and hid behind a log. Now canoes came up and they heard the noise of paddles and saw one canoe coming up to them. There were five men in the canoe and they said, what do you think? We wish to take you along. We are going up the river to make war on the people. One of the young men said, I have no arrows. They said, arrows are in the canoe. I will not go along. I might be killed. My relatives do not know where I have gone, but you, he said, turning to the other may go with them. So one of the young men went, but the other returned home. And the warriors went on up the river to a town on the other side of Kalama. The people came down to the water and they began to fight and many were killed. But presently the young man heard one of the warriors say, quick, let us go home. That Indian has been hit. Now he thought, oh, they are ghosts. He did not feel sick, but they said he had been shot. So the canoes went back to Egulac and the young man went ashore to his house and made a fire. And he told everybody and said, behold, I accompanied the ghosts and we went to fight. Many of our fellows were killed and many of those who attacked us were killed. They said I was hit and I did not feel sick. He told it all and then he became quiet. When the sun rose, he fell down. Something black came out of his mouth. His face became contorted. The people jumped up and cried. He was dead. And that's the story. So now you get to remember that 12 hours from now. Okay, lights are coming up. I should have warned you, I'm sorry. Your oh. light is still on. Yeah, I know. It switches, so it does. That's if this one's if you want to take a selfie. This one's if you want to take a picture of someone else. Mm -hmm. I think it was a thing like maybe two years ago. I'm behind. What can I say? Okay, so. Try to remember that story. Don't worry about getting it absolutely perfectly. You will not get it perfectly. That is not the point of this exercise. Give me what you have for 10 points. You can do it. Handwrite it. You can type it. I'd be okay with that. You do not have to handwrite it. You, it is an uploaded homework. So you can just upload the file to me and I'm totally fine with that. Okay. So a schema is an organized packet of knowledge that we have. So the example that I gave you a couple of weeks ago was when I showed you the picture of the teaching assistant's office and it didn't have any books in it. And yet when you give people that picture, many people falsely believe that there are books in there because you already have an idea of what should be in that office. To give you a real world example, many of you coming into my office will be surprised at how few books I have, and you will tell me so. Um, remember that my field mostly relies on papers, not on books. Like I said, don't check my file cabinets. It's bad. Um, so a schema is an organized packet of knowledge. This is often based on your experience with things. Um, and so it's designed to help you navigate the world when you're in a new place. So for example, so a couple of years ago, Freddy, last year, Freddy's opened up. That's a fast food chain. Now, I've never been to a Freddy's before until it opened up last year. And when I went to Freddy's, do you think I went inside and said, oh my gosh, this is completely new. I don't know. No, I didn't do that. 
I didn't do that. I know some of you, some of you think I might. You were very wrong. But no, I might only do that as a joke, but not for real. But why do you think I didn't have any trouble navigating Freddy's? Exactly. You have a schema in your mind for how things tend to go in a fast food restaurant. So a schema that you've already developed is designed to help you when things are new, to help you navigate things. Many of you may not have been to Cotty before. Like, I know that some of you went on campus visits, but not all of you did. Um, but you have a pretty good idea of how a lunch line works. And I know that because you probably encountered lunch lines in elementary school, in middle school, in high school, at other institutions that you may have been at. You know all of these things. You have a schema for it. Now, similarly, we have scripts, which are like schemas, but they're about time courses. So for example, this has happened to me a couple of times. I actually had somebody cut in line on me the other day at lunch to get silverware. And before they actually grabbed the silverware, I was like this. I was like, you're going you're gonna to cut in line in front of me when I'm hangry? No. But if somebody came to Cotty and they went into the lunch line and they started grabbing soda and then they went backwards. We would all find that a little weird, right? It's because we have an understanding of what the general sequence of events are. So here's another example. What is the general sequence of steps when you go to the movies, which you can no longer do here? We know our movie theater closed. Yeah, yeah. I just found out about it. I'm heartbroken. We're going to have to drive 30 minutes to go to a movie theater. <laughs> yeah. Is that a rhetorical question? Or... No, I want, I want somebody to tell me the sequence of steps when you go to a movie theater. First, you have to go to the movie theater. Then you have to somehow open the door. Step for the without breaking up. Okay, now that's a little too much detail. <laughs> okay. And then you get a cup and a ticket. You fill up your cup. You go to the theater that's on your ticket, and then you find a chair, and you sit in that chair with your food and your drink, and you turn off your phone. Okay. Now, not everybody follows the last one, turning off their phone, but in general, that's a pretty common sequence of events. You don't go to the movie without a ticket. That's called sneaking in, and I know that people do it, but I do not condone it. Um, you don't just go there to get popcorn and not watch the movie. You generally try not to get popcorn after the movie. You can, but most people don't. So a script is all about storing information about typical events. So an example is lunch in the dining hall, going to a movie, going on a date. There's typically a sequence of events. Some of you are like, a date? What is date? <laughs> I forget. I'm old. <laughs> Back in my day, we used to go on dates. <laughs> now we all just hang out with friends. We did that in high school, too. <laughs> okay, so a script will often consist of what is called a frame, like an overarching frame, and a slot. So slots allow for flexibility, and frames have an overarching, unchanging structure. So when you go out to get food somewhere, whether it's Freddy's or Panera or Chipotle or a sit-down restaurant, they all have a very similar structure. You are going to tell somebody what you want to eat, and you are going to pay for your food. Now, that's the general overarching structure. You're telling somebody what you want, they're going to bring it to you, and you're going to have to pay for it. Now, here's where it gets tricky. Some places you pay before you eat. Some places you pay after you eat. Some places you sit down. Some places you have to take away. And during the pandemic, for a lot of things, we had takeaway, and that was it. So those, whether you pay first or later, whether you eat there or elsewhere, all of that is part of the slots. The overarching frame is you go to a place, say, I want this food, and then somehow you're going to pay for that food. You don't get food for free. <laughs> so the slots allow for flexibility to help you deal with a variety of different situations. Does that kind of make sense? 
Does anybody have any questions on that? Okay. So why are these so helpful? We can form expectations. So if a friend tells me they wanna to go to Fort Scott to try out a new restaurant, I should probably remember to bring some form of payment or hope that one of my friends is paying for me because you don't get food without paying for it at a restaurant. So we can form some expectations of what is going to happen. There is going to be food. I will be expected to make a payment for it. Or if I'm going to the movies, I should expect that the movie that I watch is going to be at least two hours in length. Well, maybe hour and a half to three hours. I did go see Batman. That was a whopping three hours. Um, so we have these expectations and that helps prevent us from using too many of our cognitive resources. I don't have to think very hard about the sequence of events for going to the movie theaters. I can focus my attention on the fact that I'm overstimulated by all the noises and all the people instead because neurodivergence is fun. And by fun, I mean, it's another thing I have to think about. So. If I'm going to have to deal with that, it's better to have some of these expectations already prepared for me. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. So it also helps us fill in knowledge gaps. So if somebody tells me that there's a new restaurant, I can basically fill in any gaps and assume that there's food there, that there's probably some amount of seating there that there's probably gonna be somebody who can make change there or will take a credit card. Like, I think there's an ice cream shop in New York that actually just got into trouble because they were card only and they are technically required to also have cash. It's, it's that Van Leon's place, they made a mac and cheese ice cream. I tried it over the summer. It's surprisingly better than it sounds. <laughs> Okay. And additionally, it provides us with assistance with visual scenes. So if I'm looking for something in a kitchen and it's a bowl, for example, I've got a pretty good idea of where I should find it. I should be able to find it on a horizontal surface because that's where most bowls tend to be. I can search on a horizontal surface for it. Additionally, I can know if something is expected to be there versus if something is not expected to be there. So if I find a wrench in my refrigerator, I will know that something is not right. And I should probably talk to my partner because he's probably been doing too much housework and is probably too tired. <laughs> okay, anybody got any questions here? So let's talk a little bit about biases because here's the thing. So one of the things that I don't think I've impressed on you enough that I impress a lot more in my general psychology class is that you and I have a dual track mind. There is so much that we do that we are conscious of, but there's so much more that we are not consciously aware of. So we have one system that is very effortful and controlled, and we have another system that is based on learning through experience and is very automatic in nature. So we've already kind of talked a little bit about how schemas can bias and distort our memory. Again, going back to that example of showing a picture of a teaching assistant's office and believing that you saw books there when none were present. So we know that schemas can bias and distort our memory and it's based on our experiences, not just in our own lives, but in the media that we consume. Your information diet also creates the different schemas and biases that you have. Folks, you wanna laugh at, have a laugh at my expense? You're about to. So your information diet really plays a role in the expectations that you form. I really thought that high school would be like saved by the bell. That there would be like maybe five teachers and everybody was either popular or a nerd. And the nerds were like really nerdy, like 1950s nerdy, like, I thought it was gonna be like that because that's the only information that I had to go on. Clearly very biased. And I'm sure you all have had instances in your lives where you go into a situation and you're like, 
this is what it was on TV. I bet it's going to be like this. And then you discover, no, it's not like that at all, because the information that we learn when we rely on these, bi these schemas, they bias us and our expectations can be biased. So another way that we know that schemas create biases, because we're always trying to simplify the world, even when we're not conscious of it, is through stereotyping. So this is where it gets a little tricky. Stereotyping in general, it's very easy for our mind to do. It's not okay, but it's something our mind wants to do because seeing every single person as an individual, while appropriate, takes a lot of cognitive energy that we don't always have. When we don't have the time, when we don't have the energy, when we don't have the resources that we need and when we don't have the knowledge, we're going to fall back on those stereotypes. So we need to be very mindful when those happen because these kind of stereotypes can be incredibly harmful. So because I don't want to bring up harmful stereotypes, I'm going to give you an example of a different stereotype. So folks, I'm from Florida. I only tell people that maybe twice a month, maybe more if it's really cold. What sort of stereotypes do you have about people from Florida? I've never seen an alligator up close. I'm very happy to say. What else? They're rude. They're rude? Florida man. Huh? Florida man. That happens because we have a very, very open journalism like journalism laws. So you think of Florida man, people that do ridiculous or goofy things. Huh? Old. That is true, but there's a lot of people coming to Florida every day. So that's a stereotype though. So you probably, when you met me and I said, I'm from Florida, many of you probably didn't think, well, she's old. I joke about being old, but I'm not that old. Um, you probably didn't think I was rude. Um, you may, I, I'm pretty sure you don't think I wrestled an alligator. <laughs> yeah, they're in every, I have seen them just, I don't want to be up close to them, but yes, I have seen them. They're in every retention pond in central Florida, every lake probably has an alligator in it. <gasps> So we have these kind of stereotypes. So a stereotype is an oversimplified generalization about certain groups. So here's the good news, but there's some bad news to go with it. Overt explicit stereotypes are decreasing. So when you ask people, and this is based off of 1993 data, so we can assume that things have gotten much, much better since then, I would hope. So when we talk about overt stereotypes, um, those are overall decreasing and those have decreased over time as we get more exposure to people who are different from us. That's important. Here's the problem though. Is it because we're more tolerant or is it because of social desirability? And I'd say that yes, the more exposure that you get to people who are like you, the more the, the more tolerant you do tend to become, but you and I know that having racist ideas or sexist ideas or homophobic ideas is generally a bad thing to be. Nobody is going to openly admit to that even if they have those in their mind. So I would say it's a combination of both. We are becoming more tolerant, but we also understand that these are very bad things to be. I think maybe about six years ago, um, I believe there was a poll that they gave to white people and it basically, most white men and women do not have any friends that are, basically they have all white friends. And I'm not necessarily saying that's a bad thing or a good thing, but we know that interaction with people who think differently from us, with people who look differently from us, who grew up with different backgrounds or different perspectives, we know that that's incredibly beneficial. So your mind is going to want to stick people in boxes. Now that you know that your mind wants to do this and it often does so without you being aware of it, now you have ways that you can fix it. 
If you're aware of it, you have the opportunity to do better. So I'm interested in the cognitive side of things. So a lot of these are based on our media diet. It's why it's so important to watch shows or listen to music that consider different perspectives that you haven't thought of. That information diet is going to be critical. Another thing that you can do is you can do the implicit association test. Now, I want to be really clear about the IAT. The IAT has definitely been around since the early 2000s. I took it in my college um, social psychology class when I was a freshman. Um, so the IAT is based on your implicit biases. And ideally, it's done without social desirability causing problems. So a standard sort of task that you might get, we might want to look at associating white faces with positive words and black faces with negative words. So what we do is we give people keys to press. And we say, press this key if you get a white face or a positive adjective. Press this key if you see a black face or a negative adjective. And then we flip it. Then we go, OK, press this key for either a white face or a negative adjective. Press this key for a black face or a positive adjective. And the idea is they're looking at reaction times for those different associations. And they do get a metric of baseline behavior. So anytime something pops up as a baseline, you press a key. So they're trying to see if you're going to be faster on those instances when you associate white faces with positive words or black faces with negative words. So the idea is that's an implicit, an implicit bias. And to be clear, they don't just do this for race. They have IATs for ability. So people who are disabled, they have IATs for women being associated with mathematics or STEM. They have presidential IATs for presidential candidates. They have a variety of different things. So I would encourage you, if you want to try these, go to implicit.harvard.edu. Um, now, having said all of this, IAT gets used a lot. It's not necessarily always a perfect measure of implicit bias. There is some evidence that people can consciously control their responses. And thus, if you can consciously control your responses, it's no longer an implicit bias, bias test. So there is some questionability as to its validity, whether it's actually measuring what it says it will measure. But if nothing else, you can get a glimpse of different types of research that is done looking at implicit biases. And you might learn something really interesting about yourself. Because I believe that when you know better, you do better. If you are aware of how your mind wants to simplify things, you have an opportunity to try something different. Be curious. Don't be judgmental. All right. So it's often going to be more valid than an explicit measure. I thought we were done. I was going to cap it off. It was so perfect. And then I forgot, whoops, we got one more thing. Um, students that we, now what we will say, um, Brian Nozick, who came up with this test, will tell you that it's often more valid than explicit measures. And what we do tend to find is that oftentimes, if you do have that implicit bias, it's going to show up in explicit ways. So. When you know better, you do better. <laughs> okay, so if you get an opportunity to try some of those, remember it's implicit.harvard.edu. It's called Project Implicit. So if you can't find that website, try Project Implicit on Google. Um, and next time we are going to get into everyday memory. We're going to talk about your own personal life story memories, your autobiographical memory. We'll talk about flashbulb memories, and we will talk about eyewitness memories for crimes. We're going to have a good time. All right. Have a wonderful weekend. I will see you back here on Monday. And don't forget to try to remember the War of the Ghosts. Have a great day.